Okay. Okay, let's get started. Hey, welcome. Uh, my name is Martin. Uh, I work for Pivotal. That's a company behind the Pivotal Cloud Foundry and the whole Spring Engineering team. It's located at Pivotal, uh, and I work in that team uh, on the Spring tooling. Uh, so what we did in the past was build the Spring IDE and the Spring tools for Eclipse, basically, among other things, but that was our, our main focus. So if you download the Spring Tool Suite or install Spring IDE or Spring Tools into Eclipse, you're using the stuff that, that we built. Uh, and we are constantly looking for what comes next, what should we do next, how should we improve things for our users. Um, and of course, we came across the language of a protocol um, and what thought about what can we do maybe with that, does it make sense? Because we suffered a little bit in the past from learning 5,000 Eclipse APIs, uh, dealing with all the OSGI issues, um, not being able to, to have a huge team that can implement the same spring tuning for all the different IDEs out there, like NetBeans or IntelliJ or, or Sublime Text or Emacs or whatever people are using. So we really had to focus. Um, and then the language of our protocol came along while we were researching stuff ourselves. And we thought this might be a good option to do. So we, we tried things and we turned things into stuff that's running on the language server protocol. And that's what I would like to talk about is our experiences turning our Eclipse specific plugins, our Eclipse specific tooling for Spring and for other things into th something that you can plug into VS Code, into Atom, into Che maybe, uh, into Thea, into, into some of the IDEs out there that are supporting the language server protocol now, because that's one of the promises of the language server protocol, right? You build a language server that has all the knowledge about the language or the framework or whatever you're dealing with, and that's totally separated from the client, the IDE or the editor that is providing you the UI and user experience and the coding experience itself. Um, so that's what I would like to talk about. And this is sort of a, a high level overview about the different strategies, what you can do mm -hmm. to turn your existing tooling into something that's based on the LSP. Um, so a brief overview, don't know if you're aware of that, what, what the language server protocol is all about. So basically you have separate processes, separate projects, separate instances uh, for let's say different languages. And they run as separate processes on your machine and they get triggered by the client. The client in this case is your IDE or your editor. Came with VS Code, so those guys invented that or, and did the first implementation. Um, and those two parts, they are communicating with JSON messages. And it's a little bit misleading to call them really language servers because they're not really sitting somewhere else on a big server machine on the internet or on the cloud or somewhere. They are sitting side by side on your machine. But it's separate, it's a separate process. And it's inter-process communication between those. Um, and the idea is that you can have many of them for one for maybe one or maybe multiple for each language so that the client don't need to know anything about the concrete language that he's dealing with. So the editor knows nothing about Java knowledge and parse how to parse Java and how to provide confidences for Java or for JSON or for C Sharp or for whatever. That's all being kind of uh, moved over to the language server that has the real knowledge and analyzes code and prov gives you, gives you the and provides the features and the functionality in the background for the IDE. Um, so what's going on behind the scenes is those guys uh, are sending messages forth and back, right? The client notifies the server about, hey, I've opened a document, I edited a document, um, I, I closed a document, I opened a workspace, uh, oh, I need confidences, please give me confidences and things like that. And the, and the server, the language server, can reply to that and react to that if, if it wants to. For example, you, while you're typing and those changes are coming over the wire, the language server can say, oh yeah, I do some diagnostics and provide you some, some hints, some linting, for example, or all oh, the, here's some syntax error, or oh, you need code completion? Yeah, I can give you code completion. Here's a message back, and the message contains the code completion, and things like that. So I think it's a pretty, pretty powerful approach um, for, these, for, for, for making IDEs and language-specific tooling more decoupled. 
And this is what I think is, uh, was a nice, nice idea for us. So we started to do that, and we started to implement language service for different, what we say, languages, not mm -hmm. really awesome languages. It's more YAML dialects for specific projects that we had in our company, like uh, the Cloud Foundry manifest file. So when you deploy an app to Cloud Foundry, you write a YAML file to deploy that. If you deal with the Conquer CI system, so in kind of a Hudson Jenkins thing, which is more, more advanced and based on Docker things, CI system, you can configure that with JSON, uh, specific JSON things. Uh, and Bosch is kind of the, the cloud administration for administer huge clusters of Cloud Foundry, even across uh, cloud infrastructure providers. Uh, and they all deal with YAML files. It's fairly basic stuff, right? YAML things, and we implemented language service for all three of them uh, and, and pushed them on, on the marketplace. And we're working on more. We're working on Spring tooling and additional stuff. So that's kind of the background what I, what I can talk about. Um, so what is, what's the situation? Right? The situation is something like this at the moment, at least if you are on the same page than we are. So we built these plugins for Eclipse. And these plugins for Eclipse, they usually, uh, they look something like this, right? Running on the JVM, running inside of OGI, and calling and using different plugins in Eclipse, like JDT UI and JDT Core and the Eclipse UI and some server stuff and some XML things here and there and all those various things. It's kind of, a, of course, a simplified illustration of this situation, but this is how our environment looked like before we started. What we would like, what we would like to achieve is to be here, right? So we have, uh, on the one side, we have a language server that's totally independent and it's working on files and it's communicating with the outside world with the LSP protocol, JSON messages forth and back, that's it. On the other side, there could be still Eclipse or another IDE like VS Code or whatever, but we started to think about how can we make things work in Eclipse again, right? So that from the user's point of view, it still feels the same and feels similar, but under the hood, it's really refactored. And that's what we, would, we wanted to do first. Um, the interesting thing here is it's, um, they're communicating, those sites communicate with the JSON messages and they operate on the files on the disk. So the language server can always access all the files on disk and talk JSON to the client. Okay, so what can we do? First, let's take a look at the right side of the language server itself. So how can we turn the existing Eclipse plugin that we have and the w that we had into a language server? And therefore, I would like to talk about two different strategies. And one strategy that I have in mind is we have this situation and we try to not change too much, right? We, we try to, let's try to keep everything as it is and change just a, a few lines and as, as little as possible, uh, but still turn this into something like a language server. So you try to do something like this. You put everything together into a headless OSGI process and you put the headless non-UI bits and pieces of your stuff into this OSGI runtime and you run that. Right? You can run that. You can run your stuff on OSGI and you put the existing things that you use from Eclipse into that OSGI runtime. So it's sort of running in a headless Eclipse that is hopefully quite lightweight because you rip every, uh, all the UI things out. But you're still using maybe the resource model. You're still using JDT core, uh, the project model, and all those, those things. So you you're still quite tied to the Eclipse API, but you can put that into a separate process. Uh, and you need to put in and let what I call an LSP connector on top of that, which is understanding those JSON messages that are coming from the client and responding to that. So this is kind of the first strategy. And the f that's, it's, it's quite a nice one. It's actually used already by the Java language server. So if you go to VS Code and you install an extension, and you install the Java language server or Java language support or the Java language pack, um, you get the Java language server that's coming from JDT and from Red Hat. And it's actually exactly that, right? They use OGI, they use JVM, they put all the existing things inside and they put some additional stuff on top to talk 
uh, the LSP protocol to the outside world. And that, that's quite nice because ca you can reuse a lot of code. So that's good. The structure stays the same. You are maybe already familiar with these OSGI dependencies and libraries and all these nice, sometimes not so nice little things. So that's good. On the, on the downside, I think, is that you still get a quite heavyweight language server. Uh, and you're very tied to the things that you did before in this environment like the project model of Eclipse and the resource model of Eclipse in this case and all the existing things. Uh, and you still might lose things because you, you kind of moved out the UI. But we'll come back to the UI side a little bit later. Um, strategy one. And there's another strategy, of course. <laughs> there's one strategy. There's, all <laughs> there's an A. There's always a B in this case. Um, this is what we did for some of the cases. Um, so we had this, and we tried to get rid of as much as possible. So we more or less ripped everything away, throw everything away, put everything into a JVM, extracted our core things, and started to reuse tiny little small third-party libraries to do the job, what we exactly need. For example, use a simple YAML parser just as a library. Put everything into a uh, into maybe module, put everything together, run it, and you're done. That's good because I think um, you become more lightweight. The language server gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and I think that's, that's a good thing. It's a good thing that it's very small, very lightweight. Uh, you don't, you're not tied to the existing structure of Eclipse, of Eclipse projects, Eclipse resources, and things like that. You're not, not tied to specific versions of a library of OSGI because someone already put that into your Eclipse distribution or something like that. Um, you're really kind of, you're free. The only thing that you're limited with is, hey, okay, I need to talk to the LSP protocol, of course, so you still need to put in these, these LSP uh, connector uh, that you have to write. On the, on the other side, you also need probably to rewrite code because every Eclipse API that you used before, you cannot really use anymore, right? So you need to replace that. Really extracting the core functionality out of your plugin into this new thing uh, and use other libraries. That's the thing that we did for the language service that I, that I showed you and that's, that's what we are doing for additional ones. Uh, we even start to reuse parts of JDT, for example, but only parts that you can use without the whole Java infrastructure of JDT, like the, the parser, for example. You can just use the JDT parser to parse Java code, right? And you get the AST back. You don't need the, the, the whole model. And that's also quite, quite lightweight and quite easy and nice to use. So that's good. What about the client side? On the client side, um, we also have different strategies. Of course, I like these different strategies, right? You see, I, 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 I like to present you the options that we have. Uh, it's fairly new stuff, so I don't have definite answers to tell you you should exactly do this or that, but I will give you different options and different opinions and pros and cons for all the different things. Oh, by the way, I forgot to say, if you have questions, feel free to ask any time. You don't need to wait until the end. So feel free to raise your hand and ask questions anytime. The client side. We still have this situation at the beginning. Uh, so let's try to create the client. So what do we do? So we have we've extracted the language server uh, on the side. We, we use the files. So what, sh what should we do now? Um, maybe you already did something like this in the past, you change or ex you, you structured your plugin into a core and UI part. So one of the is the core functionality and one is the UI thing. It's what's usually done for many of the Eclipse project plugins like JDT core and JDT UI and so on and so on and so on. So on. Maybe you did the same if you um, put everything into one big piece. It's a good idea now to extract that into different pieces. Um, and next step in this strategy would be to move the UI over and put the language server protocol in between. 
between your core stuff that's running on the language server side and the UI that's sitting on the Eclipse side in this case. Right? Of course, if you want to support a different client side, like VS Code or whatever, you would have to write that part. In the case of Eclipse, you could more or less move that over. That's what we did, for example, in one of the, one of the early experiments. Uh, we had a, a YAML, a special Cloud Foundry Manifest editor inside of Eclipse, very specialized editor doing specialized stuff inside. And for us, the goal was to keep that user experience of this editor, so to keep the editor as it is. The same features, same UI, same behavior, same content types, same editor type, everything. But under the hood, the real functionality should be moved and pushed out to a language server that we can maybe reuse in different environments. So we did that. Right? So we moved the UI part, we kept the UI part inside of Eclipse as an Eclipse plugin and moved the core stuff out into a language server. Um, this is sort of nice because we already shipped that to our users, to hundreds of thousands of users maybe. Uh, and I guess nobody really noticed, <laughs> which I think is a, good, is a good thing in this case because we, we factored stuff under the hood into this language server protocol into this new architecture that we think is more powerful for the future. Uh, but the user experience on the UI stayed more or less the same. So that was good. Um, you can reuse your code, even for the, for the UI side, if you are tied to Eclipse uh, for this moment. So that's good. Um, you, of course, have to write the, the glue code, the LSP communication part. So you put the LSP community or connector on the language server side. We talked about that. You, of course, have to do something like that on the client side too. Um, so you need to do that. And an interesting observation is that um, because the, the language server protocol is async by design, you need to take that into account when writing the client side or when changing the client side. So whenever you had something on your client side that, for example, says, oh, I do content assist and I call content assist and I expect the content assist to come back within 20 milliseconds and then I show it and just, just do it as a sync call, then you're probably lost in the LSP case because the language server could be down, could be away, could take a little bit longer. You don't really know. It's designed to be async. So the message, the answer from the language server comes back sometime in the future, <laughs> as, as it's usually the case for async stuff. So you need to take that into account. And that might cause some, some rewrite and rethinking of building the client side. And you still, of course, have to keep building both sides. And if you continue down the road that way, you still would need to build the client side for all the different clients. And that's something that we don't like. We don't like that because we really would like to focus on the spring tooling in and, and Cloud Foundry tooling, whatever, inside of the language server and really put all our energy into that and leave the client as it is and let the other experts in the world for editors and IDEs do the work on the client side. And we talk with the LSP to each other. So therefore, of course, there's a strategy B. No wonder. I promise there's no strategy C today. Just strategies A, a and B. Um, so you have that. You rip those things apart. You extract core and UI of your existing implementation, and then you do something that's really fun. You just destroy the UI. You just kick it away, right? Forget about your UI. It's a nice piece of code. Rest in peace. Um, you have just your core. And the core, instead of putting the UI, your custom UI on the client side, in the Eclipse case, you put the LSP4E project in place, which is the integration for the LSP4E uh, into Eclipse. So there is already a project. There. It's not really production quality yet, so it's, it's still a work in progress. But as an outlook, it could be quite nice because it deals with, under the hood, deals with all these things of 
kicking off the language server, talking the LSP protocol, providing content assist providers and, and hover providers and things like that. And under the hood, it takes care of all these communication things. Um, there is a, a tiny little, little, little blue bubble there. You still have to write a little bit of glue code. This little bit of glue code is tell LSP4E how your language server is being started and connected. You need to let LSP4E know. It's the same for VS Code where you write this custom little extension that starts your language server or for same for Atom, whatever. Uh, it's this tiny little, little but, it, but it's, it's really a small one, so that's, that's good. But in this picture, you still don't have a real, a real UI because LSP4E does the LSP part, communicating and, and providing you the extensions. Um, but you put the generic editor in place in addition to that. So LSP4E integrates with the generic editor, which is kind of a generic part that can be customized with content assist and things like that. So then, then with that, you get the editor. You configure that with the um, syntax highlighting things and then use LSP4E to do all these communication. And then you can really kind of relax on the client side and let the server do, do all the work, which I think is, is nice. So you ne nearly have, you have to do no, work, no real work on the UI side. So that's great. But on the downside, of course, you are limited to what the generic editor and the LSP protocol offers you. So whenever you think something is missing, it should be, should be something more, I don't like how this is being implemented, um, you end up customizing the protocol, maybe doing work on both sides. But using this approach, you would still be able to do that and reuse a lot of the existing parts, with, with I, with which I think um, is a good thing. Um, the stuff that we're doing at the moment and the early, ex early experiences, I think they look really promising. The LSP project, LSP4E project, is still not production quality, it's still not mature. So there's still a lot of stuff that needs to be done. But it's, it, it's really, I think, a, a great starting point. Um, one, of the things that I one of the things that are especially interesting for us is that we start to think about putting those language servers into separate plugins that you plug into Eclipse. Right? You have a plugin, the language server is inside, you plug that into Eclipse into LSP4E, right, uh, with these tiny little bit of glue code, and then you're done, and you put that into a tiny little feature definition, and then you can reuse these feature updates and updating plugins in Eclipse for the language server itself, which we already did in the past, but for this whole Spring Tool Suite uh, thing, so, I and it was more this experience like either you update everything or you update nothing, but don't pick individual things or don't ship everything every week because people start to update uh, the whole Spring Tool Suite every week and that's going to be a real nightmare from time to time. Uh, and now we are really reducing the space down towards individual language servers that we develop and that we ship totally independent of each other. Because the only thing that's depending on each other is the language server protocol. As long as they speak the LSP protocol, that's fine. We don't have to take care about uh, what OSGI libraries in Eclipse, is it really compatible or not. Uh, we need different JVM options to run. We need a JDK 9 to run and, and the other things, they, they're not compatible with JDK 9 or whatever. We can define everything on our own for every individual language server itself and ship that and update that. And it's, it's, it's not a pain anymore to update that every day or every week. I think that's it's gonna be a a big win for us. Uh, of course, doing this refactoring work, as usual, you don't get any immediate value out of that. As I said before, we shipped the new version of the Spring Tool Suite with the tiny little language server inside for the Cloud Foundry manifest files, and nobody noticed. So there was no real benefit, except maybe from we added three four tiny little new features into the language server that wasn't there before. But all the big refactoring work under the hood, it, was, it wasn't really benefit from the user's point of view, but in the long term, I think this will pay off. 
definitely. I'm totally sure about that. Okay, those are my, my strategies, my thoughts about reflecting the stuff uh, already done. We still have some time for questions and discussions, of course. Maybe I can answer a few questions, maybe not. Who knows? Any questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the, um, the language service that we did, that we implemented for the, the three that are already kind of done, um, they are shipped as, as a plugin for Eclipse. So you can just install that into an existing Eclipse installation as long as you're on Oxygen with generic editor or whatever. You just install individual features that you can install. Uh, we ship them as extensions for VS Code. So you can install all three of them as separate extensions for VS Code. And all three of them are available as extensions for Atom, using LSP for Atom. You can just install them as packages into Atom. Yeah. And it's all the same code base, except from tiny little feature flags and hacks here and there to cope with the differences <laughs> of the clients. Uh, there was another question? Uh, the question is, what are the limitations of the LSP protocol, basically, and what, what's, what's, what's the focus at the moment? Um, the LSP protocol as it is at the moment is really focused on textual documents uh, and textual changes and files on disk. Um, but you can, as far as I know, uh, you can extend the protocol yourself if you want to. So I know that guys, uh, Jan and uh, Jan Kühnlein and, and some other guys from Typefox, they extended that, for example, for graphical representations for web UIs. Right? They have an editor in, in the web. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, guys, right? Uh, so based on text. It's still... Yeah, I, I think, I think the, the interesting situation is that the whole architecture and idea is, of course, not limited to textual documents, right? You, you could do anything, right? You can do uh, graphs or graph databases or whatever, graph structures if you want to, but then you would have to customize the protocol and implement your own messages that deal with these specific structures, of course. If you, you can do that, right? It's, it's not forbidden and technically possible, but if you do that, you of course need to understand those custom messages or those new structures on both sides of the world, on the language server side and on the client side. So if you implement your own messages, you would have to write your own extension for VS Code, for example, that listens for those specific messages and can deal with those specific messages. Or for Eclipse, specific UI plugins that can understand those specific messages. And then you can, you can do the same right but you don't benefit immediately from this situation where the protocol is being kind of standardized or defined and clients and service they can individually without knowing each other implement their own stuff and suddenly you get this feature about oh i implemented the support for go and now go support is available in 30 different clients you, you don't really get it unless you go ahead and implement the your specific extension for all the 30 clients right so that's kind of the, it's not an architectural limitation, but what is defined at the moment. My poor understanding of that. Another question? I wondered, you said there is no concrete or direct value, and then you said you have a plugin for VS Code and for Atom now, and it makes sense, like a lot of them can just come to the most of VS Code. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so I, 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 I need to, um, make the point a little bit more clear, I think, about the value creation. Uh, so 
what we did is uh, for these for one of the examples is we extracted that into language server and then we reintegrated that under the hood in the string tool suite and taking a look at that side there was no immediate value for the user right there was value creation for us because we know in the long term this language server protocol and this architecture brings a lot of benefits for us and with little extra work, we were able to publish that for VS Code and add them too. Yeah, so that was kind of value for us, but not on the, just looking from the Eclipse side and refactoring the Eclipse things into language service, there was no value for the user at that point in time, right? Yeah. Question is, is there any advantage of having three different language servers instead of one uh, for, our, for our case, yeah. for that case? Um, yeah, I don't know, to be honest. I don't know yet. It's too early to really answer the question. My, my attempt is to create many small language servers at the moment, but it's more, it's more, <laughs> more feeling, <laughs> it's more a best guess to try to really have small independent units that can evolve independently of each other. And in those three cases, we use kind of the same base library to parse YAML and things like that. Um, but we can really deal with the specifics of all three individu individually. And they don't, they don't share really anything. They don't share data, they don't share knowledge, they, don't, they have nothing to do with each other, basically. Um, so. For me, it makes sense to say, hey, guys, if you, if, you, if you do Bosch, it's very unlikely that they do Spring App development. If you're a, a cloud admin, right, you probably don't hack root apps, maybe, I don't know. Um, so it, it's really OK to just install that extension. Um, if you want to, there are these extension packs in VS Code where you can say, I install an extension pack, and then you get five extensions in a pack. Uh, <laughs> they, they reinvented the feature again. Uh, it's a set of plugins. Um, yeah, but, but I don't know. I don't know. It's, uh, we, under the hood, we work on the, on the Spring Boot support language server. And we also have a separate language server to deal with Spring property files. So YAML and regular property files uh, that are kind of allow you advanced editing and contents for all these Spring Boot properties. It's a huge thing. And it's really sophisticated stuff that we did. And we also extracted that and refactored that. And that, that's exactly one of the situations where we are not sure at the moment. Does it make sense to put that into one language server again or keep that separate? Because it's the one guy can take care of property stuff and the other guy can take care of annotations and Java code. And let's keep them separate because they don't have anything to do with each other. And then you come across situations where Ah, in this case, maybe they should share some knowledge about there is a property inside an annotation. Would it, wouldn't it be nice to get that Compton Assist? Yeah, so I think we will, we will do some merging and separating and merging and separating <laughs> tasks in the future to find out what the right granularity is. Cool. More questions? Okay. Thanks for coming. Hope you enjoyed it and uh, enjoy the conference. Thanks. <laughs>